Hi, AP Calc students. We're taking a look now at video number two over topic 6.6, six, the properties of the definite integral. But this time, we're going to do a little assembling of our areas, kind of like putting together that furniture that you buy from Ikea that we could never figure out, right? Those directions, they just baffle me. I can never do that. Now, this is going to look a little familiar to you. You're going to probably think about this and think, well, didn't we do this in a previous assignment? Those of you that are my students, Skill Builder 6.3 brings back great memories that uses these ideas. Yes, we did. Now I'm just going to formalize those things a little bit more and get you guys feeling just a bit more confident now that we've maybe had our productive struggle through that. So let's take a look at topic 6.6, six, example 2. Now, this particular lesson begins with this special circumstances with functions. And We've talked about this, but like I said, I want to formalize this idea of area under the x-axis. says so the figure to the right shows a graph of f of x. And the areas between the graph and the x-axis are going to be denoted by these values, capital A. And I want you to all trust that they are the same size. Now, what's important to understand is that we throw this idea sometimes around in calculus that, oh, in calculus, area can be negative. That's not right. Under no circumstances can area ever be negative. What's negative is the definite integral interpretation of that area that's being depicted on your graph. And so there's a fine line between those two. For instance, if we take a look at our picture and we see here from 0 to a, lowercase a, we have this area bounded by the curve and the x-axis, but it all lies above the x-axis, then it's perfectly suitable to say that the antiderivative or the integration from 0 to little a of f of x is capital A. But on the other hand, when you start thinking about integrating with boundaries from little a to b, then this area that's capital A is going to take on a completely different look when you throw it into the definite integral. And that's why we would say that the integration from little a to b is going to be negative of that a. So area is always positive. However, the definite integral interpretation of it might be negative if it's looking at an area that's underneath the axis. All right. Now, I also want to revisit some important function transformations. If you're in my class, you probably struggled a little bit with some of the items on that 6.3b skill builder. And maybe this will help formalize that. The graph of the function f of x is shown below. Uh, hmm, boy, that graph looks awfully familiar. Doesn't that, doesn't that, is that the sine curve, perhaps? It is, but I'm not really interested in calling it anything specific. Let's just refer to it as f of x. Now, if we take a look at what's in the green box here, we have the graph of the function y equal f of negative x. And I know that you explored this a little bit in your 6.3b skill builder. Now, by definition, f of negative x is really a function that's symmetric with respect to the origin. It's an odd function. That's something that you likely went over in a previous course, perhaps a pre-calc course, but it's so easily forgotten because you don't use it and apply it a whole lot. The way that we were trying to graph these with a little bit more ease is saying that you could just take the original graph, and that's what's left behind here with this dashed line. If you'll notice, that dashed line mimics this blue curve over here to the left. But if you think about that dashed blue curve, just at least this part, it's reflected around the y-axis, and it produces this green section that I'm highlighting right there. Just like this blue portion reflects over the y-axis and produces this portion. So we can think about reflecting over the y-axis to obtain this new kind of symmetry with respect to the origin. and then. Finally, what happens when you're graphing y equal f of the absolute value of x here in the um, orange box? Well, the graph is a reflection of only the positive side of the y-axis. You're basically saying that if the x values that you once had, well, there's nothing wrong with them if they're positive because the absolute values will have no effect on them. So why would the graph change? But if you look at the other side, 
we're like, well, wait a minute. This original graph is no good on the left side of the y-axis because anything that was on the right side is now going to be the reflection on the left side because all of these negative x's are going to be tricked into thinking that they're positive and therefore produce the same curve. All right, so there we have those two tricky reflections. Let's go ahead and take a look at example two. So the figure to the right shows the graph of F, the areas of the regions between the graphs of F and the x-axis are labeled. And it is known that the integration from C to zero of F of X is equal to three. All right, so what are we gonna do with that? Determine the value of each definite integral. So we start with the integral from zero to E of F of X. So if we go to our picture, our zero is right here, and our E, of course, is over here. Well, there's really nothing out of the ordinary with trying to determine that particular area. We're going to treat the 7 as being negative. And we're actually going to use one of our properties that we mentioned in the previous video. But it's not likely that a student would necessarily have to write this out in order to pull it off. But it is true that if you integrate from 0 to E, you get the integral from 0 to D plus the integral from D up to your E. Now, keep in mind, I'm not going to keep that on my screen because I'm going to run out of room here. But that's what we're thinking when we say that we can take this 7 that's below the x-axis and therefore call it negative and add it to this 10 that's above the x-axis. And so the answer to this would indeed be negative 7 plus 10, which of course is 3. Let's move on to part D. Let's integrate from D, I'm sorry, from B up to D. Well, now we're moving across the origin. So we're going to start here at B and go to D. Again, nothing unusual about this. It's moving from the left to the right. We can take any areas that were below the x-axis, treat them as negative, any areas above the x-axis, treat them as positive. Now, you might look here at this integral from C to 0. That's where this little piece here is going to come into play. Basically, that piece allows you to just to plop the 3 in for this spot and then resume business as usual. So if we take the negative 5, add to positive 3, and then add to that a negative 7, the net difference is negative 9. And so we have a definite integral value that is negative in this case. More area was below the x-axis than above. Now things start to get interesting in part C. This starts to look a little bit like that worksheet that you've struggled through. When we integrate from A to 0, nothing unusual about the order that we're doing things. Here's our A, and here's our 0. The only difference is that we're taking the absolute value of that curve the entire function. Now we didn't outline these in the video here to start, but the absolute value of this function is basically going to render any pieces that were below the x-axis to be above the x-axis. So we're gonna think about this five as being up here and now nice and positive. And so in that instance, the 15 starts things off. We add the positive five, we finish up with that positive three. And of course, we have an area of 23 out of that. All right, we're halfway done. Let's take a look at part D. Honestly, a problem like part D is usually going to be one of the easier ones, because if the absolute values are around the entire function, then we just really need to worry about, not, not just around the function, but around the integral of the function. We were in part C looking at a problem where the absolute values were just around the function. So all you've got to do is just do your integration from A to 0 like normal as we see it on the page. 15 minus a 5 plus a 3. Notice the difference in that setup versus our previous problem. But then the absolute values can find their place back in the question. And then you see here that you're going to get absolute value of 13 which is still 13. Now, parts E and F will actually use 
our, our rules up here that we focused on again and deal with some very unusual boundary circumstances. So if we look at E, part E says, we are going to take this particular graph and apply the absolute value of x, uh, absolute values only around the x. Well, if you remember, what that does is it essentially takes what we see on the right side and reflects it around the left side. So if I could try to draw this, we'd have something like this. This would be our reflection. I know that's really tough to see because it's interfering with what was already on the left side. But what's important to note is that this point D would be reflected over as well and E as well. So you would have a negative E and a negative D. So when finding the integral from negative E to positive E of this new graph, we're going to take this 10 that's carried over to the left side and start with him. And then this 7 that's below the x-axis is carried over to the left side. But because he's below the x-axis, we subtract. Notice we have another negative 7. And then we finish up with a positive 10 that takes us from negative e all the way to positive e. And you can hopefully see that this is 20 minus 14, which is positive 6. It's a little bit tricky because we had to think about the reflection impact on what these places along the x-axis were. The same thing is going to happen to part f. Let's clean up our picture. Think about the graph of f of negative x. Now that's going to be a complete turnaround. In other words, the piece of the graph on the left side is going to move to the right, and the pieces of the graph on the right is going to move to the left. Now because my picture is going to get really messed up if I try to draw that on top, maybe I can sketch that over here. Maybe I can also be a little clever and use a white pen and scribble out the page number. How's that? <laughs> All right. So let's start with this right side, this little dip below and a little dip up above. If that gets reflected, I would have something like that. And I'm going to go ahead and place those numbers in so I remember what they are. Now this left side is going to get reflected, and I'm going to look at something like this. And I'll replace those numbers. This was a 3, if you remember. This is a 5, and that's a 15. Now again, I know the 7 and the 5 that you see in that picture are going to be treated as negative. We'll take care of that when we assemble the integral. Now, what about this negative c to a business? Well, as you can see, the c that was on the left side here is now going to be over on this side. It's just going to take its opposite sign. The A that was way over here on the left side is now going to get reflected, and it's going to find itself on this side, again, with an opposite sign. And I know it's confusing because students will look at this and say, oh, wait a minute, negative C, negative A, those aren't negative numbers because they're on the right side of the y-axis. Well, it's very likely that these numbers A, B, and C were already negative, and so you have to consider that. Now, in this problem, you see that you have a 5 below the x-axis, which would be negative, a 15 above the x-axis, that add to make 10. That's how you would assemble areas with some very unusual function transformations. One more video left. It's a short one about discontinuities and integration. Be sure to check it out. Thanks for joining.